volume one chapter fifteen of travels in the interior of africa by mungo park this librivox recording is in the public domain negro curiosity a message from the king wara is a small town surrounded with high walls and inhabited by a mixture of mandingos and fulas the inhabitants employ themselves chiefly in cultivating corn which they exchange with the moors for salt here being in security from the moors and very much fatigue i resolved to rest myself and meeting with a hearty welcome from the duty whose name was flancherry i laid myself down upon a bullock's hide and slept soundly for about two hours the curiosity of the people would not allow me to sleep any longer they had seen my saddle and bridle and were assembled in great numbers to learn who i was and whence i came some were of opinion that i was an arab others insisted that i was some moorish sultan and they continued to debate the matter with such warmth that the noise awoke me the duty who had formerly been at gambia had last interposed in my behalf and assured them that i was certainly a white man but he was convinced from my appearance that i was a poor one july sixth it rained very much in the night and at daylight i departed in company with a negro who was going to a town called dingi for corn but we had not proceeded above a mile before the ass upon which he rode threw him off and he returned leaving me to prosecute the journey by myself i reached dingi about noon but the duty and most of the inhabitants had gone into the fields to cultivate corn and old fula observing me wandering about the town desired me to come to his hut where i was well entertained and the duty when he returned sent me some victuals for myself and corn for my horse july seventh in the morning when i was about to depart my landlord with a great deal of diffidence begged me to give him a lock of my hair he had been told he said that white men's hair made a saffy that would give to the possessor all the knowledge of white men i had never before heard of so simple a mode of education but instantly complied with the request i reached a small town called wasabo about twelve o'clock where i was obliged to stop until an opportunity should offer of procuring a guide to satali which is distant a very long day's journey through woods without any beaten path i accordingly took up my residence at the duty's house where i stayed four days during which time i amused myself by going to the fields with the family to plant corn cultivation is carried on here on a very extensive scale and as the natives themselves express it hunger is never known in cultivating the soil the men and women work together they use a large sharp hoe much superior to that used in gambia but they are obliged for fear of the moors to carry their arms with them to the field the master with the handle of his spear marks the field into regular plats one of which is assigned to every three slaves on the evening of the eleventh eight of the fugitive cartans arrived at wasabu they had found it impossible to live under the tyrannical government of the moors and were now going to transfer their allegiance to the king of bambara they offered to take me along with them as far as satil and i accepted the offer july twelfth at daybreak we set out and travelled with uncommon expedition until sunset we stopped only twice in the course of the day once at a watering place in the woods and at another time at the ruins of a town formerly belonging to daisy called illa comp the corn town 
When we arrived in the neighborhood of Satil, the people who were employed in the cornfields, seeing so many horsemen, took us for a party of Moors and ran screaming away from us. The whole town was instantly alarmed, and the slaves were seen in every direction driving the cattle and horses towards the town. It was in vain that one of our company galloped up to undeceive them. It only frightened them the more, and we arrived at the town we found the gate shut, and the people all under arms. After a long parley we were permitted to enter, and, as there was every appearance of a tornado, the duty allowed us to sleep in his balloon, and gave us each a bullock's hide for a bed. July 13th. Early in the morning we again set forward. The roads wet and slippery, but the country was very beautiful, abounding with rivulets, which were increased by the rain into rapid streams. About ten o'clock we came to the rains of a village, which had been destroyed by the war about six months before. About noon my horse was much fatigued that I could not keep up with my companions. I therefore dismounted and desired them to ride on, telling them that I would follow as soon as my horse had rested a little. But I found them unwilling to leave me. The lions, they said, were very numerous in those parts, and although they might not so readily attack a body of people, they would soon find out an individual. It was therefore agreed that one of the company should stay with me to assist in driving my horse, while the others passed on to Galu to procure lodgings and collect grass for the horses before night. Accompanied by this worthy negro, I drove my horse before me until about four o'clock, when we came in sight of Galu, a considerable town, standing in a fertile and beautiful valley surrounded with high rocks. Early next morning, July 14th, having first returned many thanks to our landlord for his hospitality, while my fellow travellers offered up their prayers that he might never want, we set forward and about three o'clock arrived at Mordra, a large town famous for its trade in salt, which the Moors bring here in great quantities to exchange for corn and cotton cloth. As most of the people here are Mohammedans, it is not allowed to the Kaffirs to drink beer, which they called Neodolo, corn spirit, except in certain houses. In one of these I saw about twenty people sitting round large vessels of this beer with the greatest conviviality, many of them in a state of intoxication. On the morning of the 16th, we again set forward, accompanied by a coffle of fourteen asses, loaded with salt, bound for San Sanding. The road was particularly romantic, between two rocky hills, but the moors sometimes lie in wait here to plunder strangers. As soon as we had reached the open country, the master of the salt coffle thanked us for having stayed with him so long, and now desired us to ride on. The sun was almost set before we reached Talibu. In the evening we had a most tremendous tornado, the house in which we lodged being flat-roofed. Amid the rain in streams, the floor was soon ankle-deep, the fire extinguished, and we were left to pass the night upon some bundles of firewood that happened to lie in a corner. July 17th, we departed from Datalabu, and about ten o'clock passed a large coffle returning from Sago with corn hose, mats, and other household utensils. At five o'clock we came to a large village where we intended to pass the night, but the duty would not receive us. When we departed from this place, my horse was so much fatigued that I was under the necessity of driving him, and it was dark before we reached Fanibu, a small village, 
the duty of which no sooner heard that i was a white man than he brought out three old muskets and was much disappointed when he was told that i could not repair them july eighteenth we continued our journey but owing to a light supper the preceding night we felt ourselves rather hungry this morning and endeavored to procure some corn at a village but without success my horse becoming weaker and weaker every day was now a very little service to me i was obliged to drive him before me for the greater part of the day and did not reach geosoro until eight o'clock in the evening i found my companions wrangling with the duty who had absolutely refused to give or sell them any provisions and as none of us had tasted victuals for the last twenty-four hours we were by no means disposed to fast another day if we could help it but finding our entreaties without effect and being very much fatigued i fell asleep from which i was awakened about midnight with the joyful information kininata the victuals are come this made the remainder of the night pass away pleasantly and at daybreak july nineteenth we resumed our journey proposing to stop at a village called du link ebu for the night following my fellow travellers having better horses than myself soon left me and i was walking barefoot driving my horse when i was met by a coffle of slaves about seventy in number coming from sago they were tied together by their necks with thongs of a bullock's hide twisted like a rope seven slaves upon a thong and a man with a musket between every seven many of the slaves were ill-conditioned and a great number of them women in the rear came sidi mohammed's servant whom i remembered to have seen at the camp of benom he presently knew me and told me that these slaves were going to morocco by way of ludamar and the great desert in the afternoon as i approached du link abu i met about twenty moors on horseback the owners of the slaves i had seen in the morning they were well armed with muskets and were very inquisitive concerning me but not so rude as their countrymen generally are from them i learnt that sidi mahomed was not at sago but had gone to kakaba for gold dust when i arrived at du link abu i was informed that my fellow travellers had gone on but my horse was so much fatigued that i could not possibly proceed after them the duty of the town at my request gave me a draught of water which is generally looked upon as an earnest of greater hospitality and i had no doubt of making up for the toils of the day by a good supper and a sound sleep unfortunately i had neither the one or the other the night was rainy and tempestuous, and the duty limited his hospitality to the draught of water july twentieth in the morning i endeavoured both by entreaties and threats to procure some victuals from the duty but in vain i even begged some corn from one of his female slaves as she was washing it at the well and had the mortification to be refused however when the duty was gone to the fields his wife sent me a handful of meal which i mixed with water and drank for breakfast about eight o'clock i departed from du link abu and at a noon stopped a few minutes at a large koree where i had some milk given me by the fulas and hearing that two negroes were going from thence to sega i was happy to have their company and we set out immediately about four o'clock we stopped at a small village where one of the negroes met with an acquaintance who invited us to a sort of public entertainment which was conducted with more than common propriety a dish made of sour milk and meal 
called sinkatu and beer made from their corn was distributed with great liberality and the women were admitted into the society a circumstance i had never before observed in africa there was no compulsion every one was at liberty to drink as he pleased they nodded to each other when about to drink and on setting down the calabash commonly said burka thank you both men and women appeared to be somewhat intoxicated but they were far from being quarrelsome departing from thence we passed several large villages where i was constantly taken for a moor and became the subject of much merriment to the bambarans who seeing me drive my horse before me laughed heartily at my appearance he has been at mecca said one you may see that by his clothes another asked me if my horse was sick a third wished to purchase it etc so that i believe the very slaves were ashamed to be seen in my company just before it was dark we took up our lodging for the night at a small village where i procured some victuals for myself and some corn for my horse at the moderate price of a button and was told that i should see the niger which the negroes call joliba or the great water early the next day the lions are here very numerous the gates are shut a little after sunset and nobody allowed to go out the thoughts of seeing the niger in the morning and the troublesome buzzing of mosquitoes prevented me from shutting my eyes during the night and i had saddled my horse and was in readiness before daylight but on account of the wild beasts we were obliged to wait until the people were stirring and the gates were opened this happened to be a market day at sego and the roads were everywhere filled with people carrying different articles to sell we passed four large villages and at eight o'clock saw the smoke over sego as we approached the town i was fortunate enough to overtake the fugitive cartans to whose kindness i had been so much indebted in my journey through bambara they readily agreed to introduce me to the king and we rode together through some marshy ground where as i was anxiously looking around for the river one of them called out geo afili see the water and looking forwards i saw with infinite pleasure the great object of my mission the long sought for majestic niger glittering in the morning sun as broad as the thames at westminster and flowing slowly to the eastward i hastened to the brink and having drunk of the water lifted up my fervent thanks in prayer to the great ruler of all things for having thus far crowned my endeavors with success the circumstances of the niger's flowing towards the east and its collateral points did not however excite my surprise for although i had left europe in great hesitation on this subject and rather believed it ran in the contrary direction i had made such frequent inquiries during my progress concerning this river and received from negroes of different nations such clear and decisive assurances that its general course was towards the rising sun a scarce left any doubt on my mind and more especially as i knew that major houghton had collected similar information in the same manner sago the capital of bambara at which i now arrived consists properly speaking of four distinct towns two on the northern bank of the niger called sago caro and sago bu and two on the southern bank called sago su caro and sago si caro they all are surrounded with high mud walls the houses are built of clay of a square form with flat roofs 
Some of them have two stories, and many of them are whitewashed. Besides these buildings, Moorish mosques are seen in every quarter, and the streets, though narrow, are broad enough for every useful purpose, in a country where wheel carriages are entirely unknown. From the best inquiries I could make, I have reason to believe that Sago contains altogether about 30,000 inhabitants. The king of Bambara constantly resides at Sago si Coro. He employs a great many slaves in conveying people over the river, and the money they receive, though the fare is only ten cowrie shells for each individual, furnishes a considerable revenue to the king in the course of a year the canoes are of singular construction each of them being formed of the trunks of two large trees rendered concave and joined together not side by side but end ways the junction being exactly across the middle of the canoe they are therefore very long and disproportionately narrow and have neither decks nor masts they are however very roomy for i observed in one of them four horses and several people crossing over the river when we arrived at the ferry with a view to pass over to that part of the town in which the king resides we found a great number waiting for a passage they looked at me with silent wonder and i distinguished with concern many moors among them there were three different places of embarkation and the ferrymen were very diligent and expeditious but from the crowd of people i could not immediately obtain a passage and sat down upon the bank of the river to wait for a more favourable opportunity the view of this extensive city the numerous canoes upon the river the crowded population and the cultivated state of the surrounding country formed altogether a prospect of civilization and magnificence which i little expected to find in the bosom of africa i waited more than two hours without having an opportunity of crossing the river during which time the people who had crossed carried information to masong the king that a white man was waiting for a passage and was coming to see him he immediately sent over one of his chief men who informed me that the king could not possibly see me until he knew what had brought me into his country and that i must not presume to cross the river without the king's permission he therefore advised me to lodge at a distant village to which he pointed for the night and said that in the morning he would give me further instructions how to conduct myself this was very discouraging however as there was no remedy i set off for the village where i found to my great mortification that no person would admit me into his house i was regarded with astonishment and fear and was obliged to sit all day without victuals in the shade of a tree and the night threatened to be very uncomfortable for the wind rose and there was great appearance of a heavy rain and the wild beasts are so very numerous in the neighbourhood that i should have been under the necessity of climbing up a tree and resting among the branches about sunset however as i was preparing to pass the night in this manner and had turned my horse loose that he might gaze at liberty a woman returning from the labours of the field stopped to observe me and perceiving that i was weary and, and dejected inquired into my situation which i briefly explained to her whereupon with looks of great compassion she took up my saddle and bridle and told me to follow her having conducted me into her hut she lighted up a lamp 
spread a mat on the floor, and told me I might remain there for the night. Finding that I was very hungry, she said she would procure me something to eat. She accordingly went out and returned in a short time with a very fine fish, which, having caused to be half broiled upon some elm embers, she gave me for supper. The rites of hospitality being thus performed towards a stranger in distress, my worthy benefactress, pointing to the mat and telling me I might sleep there without apprehension, called to the female part of her family who had stood gazing on me all the while in a fixed astonishment to resume their task of spinning cotton in which they continued to employ themselves great part of the night they lightened their labor by songs one of which was composed ex tempore for i was myself the subject of it it was sung by one of the young women the rest joining in a sort of chorus the air was sweet and plaintive and the words literally translated were these the winds roared and the rains felled the poor white man faint and weary came and sat under our tree he has no mother to bring him milk no wife to grind his corn chorus let us pity the white man no mother has he etc etc trifling as this recital may appear to the reader to a person in my situation the circumstance was affecting in the highest degree i was oppressed by such unexpected kindness and slept fled from my eyes in the morning i presented my compassionate landlady with two of the four brass buttons which remained on my waistcoat the only recompense i could make her july twenty first i continued in the village all this day in conversation with the natives who came in crowds to see me but was rather uneasy towards evening to find that no message had arrived from the king the more so the people began to whisper that mansong had received some very unfavorable accounts of me from the moors and slatees residing at sago who, who it seems were exceedingly suspicious concerning the motives of my journey i learned that many consultations had been held with the king concerning my reception and disposal and some of the villagers frankly told me that i had many enemies and must expect no favor july twenty second about eleven o'clock a messenger arrived from the king but he gave me very little satisfaction he inquired particularly if i had brought any present and seemed much disappointed when he was told that i had been robbed of everything by the moors when i proposed to go along with him he told me to stop until the afternoon when the king would send for me july twenty third in the afternoon another messenger arrived from Masong with a bag in his hands he told me it was the king's pleasure that i should depart forthwith from the vinissage of sago but that a song wishing to relieve a white man in distress had sent me five thousand cowries to enable me to purchase provisions in the course of my journey the messenger added that if my intentions were really to proceed to jenny he had orders to accompany me as a guide to san sanding i was at first puzzled to account for this behavior of the king but from the conversation i had with the guide i had afterwards reason to believe that masson would willingly have admitted me into his presence at sago but was apprehensive he might not be able to protect me against the blind and invertate malice of the moorish inhabitants his conduct therefore was at once prudent and liberal 
the circumstances under which i made my appearance at sago were undoubtedly such as might create in the mind of the king a well-wanted suspicion that i wished to conceal the true object of my journey he argued probably as my guide argued who when he was told that i had come from a great distance and though many dangers to behold the joliba river naturally inquired if there were no rivers in my own country and whether one river was not like another notwithstanding this and in spite of the jealous machinations of the moors this benevolent prince thought it sufficient that a white man was found in his dominions in a condition of extreme wretchedness and that no other plea was necessary to entitle the sufferer to his bounty End of Volume 1, Chapter 15 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Volume 2, Introduction of Travels in the Interior of Africa This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Travels in the Interior of Africa. Introduction. The first of the two volumes which contained Mungo Park's travel in the interior of Africa brought him through many perils to the first sight of the Niger, and left him sick and solitary, stripped of nearly all that he possessed a half-starved white man on a half-starved horse he was helped on by a bag of cowries from a kindly chief but in this volume he has not advanced far before he is stripped of it all there is not in the range of english literature a more interesting traveller's tale than was given to the world in this book which this volume completes it took the deeper hold upon its readers because it appeared at a time when english hearts began to be stirred by the wrongs of slavery but at any time there would be strong human interest in the unconscious painting of the writer's character as he makes his way over far regions in which no white man had before been seen with firm resolve and with good temper as well as courage and prudence which bring him safe through many a hair-breath escape there was a true kindness in mungo park that found answering kindness and brought out the spirit of humanity in those upon whose good will his life depends in the negroes often although never in the moors there was no flinching in the man who when robbed of his horse stripped to the shirt in a forest and left upon a lion's track looked down with a botanist's eye on the beauty of a tiny moss at his feet drew comfort from it and labored on with a quiet faith in god the same eye was as quick to recognize the diverse characters of men in mungo park shrewd humor and right feeling went together whatever he had to say he said clearly and simply and it went straight home he had the good fortune to be born before picturesque writing was invented when we returned to the gambia with mungo park under the same escort with a coffle of slaves on their way to be shipped for the use of christians from the strength of his unlabored narrative we get clear knowledge unclouded by a rainbow mist of words he is of one blood with the sailors in whom hackluck delighted end of volume two introduction recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c volume two chapter sixteen 
of Travels in the Interior of Africa by Mungo Park. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Volume 2, Chapter 16 Villages on the Niger Determines to Go No Farther Eastward. Being, in the manner that has been related, compelled to leave Sago, I was conducted the same evening to a village about seven miles to the eastward, with some of the inhabitants of which my guide was acquainted, and by whom we were well received. He was very friendly and communicative, and spoke highly of the hospitality of his countrymen, but withal told me that if Jean was the place of my destination, which he seemed to have hitherto doubted, I had undertaken an enterprise of greater danger than probably I was apprised of. For, al for although the town of Jean was normally part of the king of Bambara's dominions, it was, in fact, he said, a city of the Moors, the leading part of the inhabitants being Bushreens, and even the governor himself, though appointed by Masong of the same sect. Thus was I in danger of falling a second time into the hands of men who would consider it not only justifiable, but meritous, to destroy me, and this reflection was aggravated by the circumstance that the danger increased as I advanced in my journey, for I learned that the places beyond Jean were under the Moorish influence in a still greater degree than Jean itself, and Timbuktu, the great object of my search, altogether in possession of that savage and merciless people who allowed no Christian to live there. But I had now advanced too far to think of returning to the westward on such vague and uncertain information, and determined to proceed, and being accompanied by the guide, I departed from the village on the morning of the 24th. About eight o'clock we passed a large town called Kaba, situated in the midst of a beautiful and highly cultivated country, bearing a greater resemblance to the centre of England than to what I should have supposed had been the middle of Africa. The people were everywhere employed in collecting the fruit of shade trees, from which they prepare the vegetable butter mentioned in former parts of this work. These trees grow in great abundance over this part of Bambara. They are not planted by the natives, but are found growing naturally in the woods, and in clearing woodland for cultivation every tree is cut down but the shea. The tree itself very much resembles the American oak, and the fruit, from the kernel of which, being first dried in the sun, the butter is prepared by boiling the kernel in water, has somewhat the appearance of a Spanish olive. The kernel is enveloped in a sweet pulp, under a thin green rind, and the butter produced from it, besides the advantage of its keeping the whole year without salt, is whiter, firmer, and to my palate of a richer flavor, than the best butter I ever tasted made from cow's milk. The growth and preparation of this commodity seemed to be among the first objects of a african industry in this and the neighboring states and it constitutes a main article of their inland commerce we passed in the course of the day a great many villages inhabited chiefly by fishermen and in the evening about five o'clock arrived at san sanding a very large town containing as i was told from eight to ten thousand inhabitants this place is much resorted to by the Moors, who bring salt from Buru and beads and coral from the Mediterranean, to exchange here for gold and cotton cloth. This cloth they sell to great advantage in Buru and other Moorish countries, where, on account of the want of rain, no cotton is cultivated. 
I desired my guide to conduct me to the house in which we were to lodge by the most private way possible. We accordingly rode along between the town and the river, passing by a creek or harbor, in which I observed twenty large canoes, most of them fully loaded, and covered with mats to prevent the rain from injuring the goods. As we proceeded, three other canoes arrived, two with passengers and one with goods. I was happy to find that all the negro inhabitants took me for a moor, under which character I should probably have passed unmolested, had not a moor, who was sitting by the riverside, discovered the mistake and, setting up a loud exclamation, brought together a number of his countrymen. When I arrived at the house of County Mammy D, the duty of the town, I was surrounded with hundreds of people speaking a variety of different dialects, all equally intelligible to me. At length, by the assistance of my guide, who acted as interpreter, I understood that one of the spectators pretended to have seen me at one place, and another at some other place, and a Moorish woman absolutely swore that she had kept my house three years at Galam, on the river Senegal. It was plain that they mistook me for some other person, and I desired two of the most confident to point towards the place where they had seen me. They pointed due south, hence I think it probable that they came from Cape Coast, where they might have seen many white men. Their language was different from any I had yet heard. The Moors now assembled in great number, with their usual arrogance, compelling the Negroes to stand at a distance. They immediately began to question me concerning my religion, but finding that I was not master of Arabic, they sent for two men, whom they call e Hudi, or Jews, in hopes that they might be able to converse with me. These Jews, in dress and appearance, very much resemble the Arabs, but though they so far conform to the religion of Mohammed as to recite in public prayers from the Koran, they are but little respected by the Negroes, and even the Moors themselves allowed that, though I was a Christian, it was a better man than a Jew. They, however, insisted that, like the Jews, I must conform so far as to repeat the Mohammedan prayers, and when I attempted to waive the subject by telling them that I could not speak Arabic, one of them, a sharif from Tuat, in the great desert, started up and swore by the Prophet that if I refused to go to the mosque, he would be one that would assist in carrying me thither, and there is no doubt that this threat would have been immediately executed had not my landlord interposed on my behalf. He told them that I was the king's stranger, and he could not see me ill-treated whilst I was under his protection. He therefore advised them to let me alone for the night, assuring them that in the morning I should be sent about my business. This somehow appeased their clamor, but they compelled me to ascend a high seat by the door of the mosque, in order that everybody might see me, for the people had assembled in such numbers as to be quite ungovernable, climbing upon the houses and squeezing each other like the spectators at an execution. Upon this seat I remained until sunset, when I was conducted into a neat little hut, with a small court before it, the door of which Count Mamadi shut, to prevent any person from disturbing me. But this precaution could not exclude the Moors. They climbed over the top of the mud wall and came in crowds into the court, in order, they said, to see me perform my evening devotions and eat eggs. 
the former of these ceremonies i did not think proper to comply with but i told them that i had no objection to eat eggs provided they would bring me eggs to eat my landlord immediately brought me seven hen's eggs and was much surprised to find that i could not eat them raw for it seemed to be a prevalent opinion among the inhabitants of the interior that europeans subsist almost entirely on this diet when i had succeeded in persuading my landlord that this opinion was without foundation and that i would gladly partake of any victuals which he might think proper to send me he ordered a sheep to be killed and part of it to be dressed for my supper about midnight when the moors had left me he paid me a visit and with much earnestness desired me to write him a safi if a moor safi is good said the hospitable old man a white man's must needs be better i readily furnished him with one possessed of all the virtues i could concentrate for it contained the lord's prayer the pen with which it was written was made of a reed a little charcoal and gum water made very tarble ink and a thin board answered the purpose of paper july twenty fifth early in the morning before the murrers were assembled i departed from san sanding and slept the ensuing night at a small town called sibili from whence on the day following i reached nyera a large town at some distance from the river where i halted the twenty seventh to have my clothes washed and to recruit my horse the duty there had a very commodious house a flat roofed and two stories high he showed me some gunpowder of his own manufacturing and pointed out as a great curiosity a little brown monkey that was tied to a stake by the door telling me that he came from a far distant country called kong july twenty eighth i departed from nyara and reached nyami about noon this town is inhabited chiefly by fulas from the kingdom of massina the duty i know not why would not receive me but civilly sent his son on horseback to conduct me to modibu which he assured me was at no great distance we rode nearly in a direct line through the woods but in general went forwards with great circumspection i observed that my guide frequently stopped and looked under the bushes on inquiring the reason of this caution he told me that lions were very numerous in that part of the country and frequently attacked people travelling through the woods while he was speaking my horse started and looking round i observed a large animal of the camel leopard kind standing at a little distance the neck and forelegs were very long the head was furnished with two short black horns turning backwards the tail which reached down to the ham joint had a tuft of hair at the end the animal was of a mouse colour and it trotted away from us in a very sluggish manner moving its head from side to side to see if we were pursuing it shortly after this as we were crossing a large open plain where there were a few scattered bushes my guide who was a little way before me wheeled his horse round in a moment calling out something in the fula language which i did not understand i inquired in mandingo what he meant wara billy billy a very large lion said he and made signs for me to ride away but my horse was too much fatigued so we rode slowly past the bush from which the animal had given us the alarm not seeing anything myself however i thought my guide had been mistaken when the fula suddenly put his hand to his mouth exclaiming supa and ali god preserve us and to my great surprise i then perceived a large red lion 
at a short distance from the bush with his head couched between his forepaws i expected he would instantly spring upon me and instinctively pulled my feet from my stirrups to throw myself on the ground that my horse might become the victim rather than myself but it is probable the lion was not hungry for he quietly suffered us to pass though we were fairly within his reach my eyes were so riveted upon the sovereign of the beasts that i found it impossible to remove them until we were at a considerable distance we now took a circuitous route through some swampy ground to avoid any more of these disagreeable encounters at sunset we arrived at modibu a delightful village on the banks of the niger commanding a view of the river for many miles both to the east and west the small green islands the peaceful retreat of some industrious fulas whose cattle are here secure from the depredations of wild beasts and the majestic breadth of the river which is here much larger than at sago render the situation one of the most enchanting in the world here are caught great plenty of fish by means of long cotton nets which the natives make themselves and used nearly in the same manner as nets are used in europe i observed the head of a crocodile lying upon one of the houses which they told me had been killed by the shepherds in a swamp near the town these animals are not uncommon in the niger but i believe they are not oftentimes found dangerous they are of little account to the traveller when compared with the amazing swarms of mosquitoes which rise from the swamps and creeks in such numbers as to harass even the most torpid of the natives and as my clothes were now almost worn to rags i was but ill prepared to resist their attacks i usually passed the night without shutting my eyes walking backwards and forwards fanning myself with my hat their stings raised numerous blisters on my legs and arms which together with the want of rest made me very feverish and uneasy july twenty ninth early in the morning my landlord observing that i was sickly hurried me away sending a servant with me as a guide to key but though i was little able to walk my horse was still less able to carry me and about six miles to the east of modibu in crossing some rough clayey ground he fell and the united strength of the guide and myself could not place him again upon his legs i sat down for some time beside this worn-out associate of my adventures but finding him still unable to rise i took off the saddle and bridle and placed a quantity of grass before him i surveyed the poor animal as he lay panting on the ground with sympathetic emotion for i could not suppress the sad apprehension that i should myself in a short time lie down and perish in the same manner of fatigue and hunger with this foreboding i left my poor horse and with great reluctance followed my guide on foot along the bank of the river until about noon when we reached key which i found to be nothing more than a small fishing village the duty assured the old man who was sitting by the gate received me very coolly and when i informed him of my situation and begged his protection told me with great indifference that he paid very little attention to fine speeches and that i should not enter his house my guide remonstrated in my favour but to no purpose for the duty remained inflexible in his determination i knew not where to rest my wearied limbs but was happily relieved by a fishing canoe belonging to Scylla, which was at that moment coming down the river. The duty waved to the fisherman to come near, and desired him to take charge of me as far as Morzen. 
the fishermen after some hesitation consented to carry me and i embarked in the canoe in company with the fisherman his wife and a boy the negro who had conducted me from modibu now left me i requested him to look to my horse on his return and take care of him if he was still alive which he promised to do departing from key we proceeded about a mile down the river when the fisherman paddled the canoe to the bank and desired me to jump out having tied the canoe to a stake he stripped off his clothes and dived for such a length of time that i thought he had actually drowned himself and was surprised to see his wife behave with so much indifference upon the occasion but my fears were over when he raised up his head astern of the canoe and called for a rope with this rope he dived a second time and then got into the canoe and ordered the boy to assist him in pulling at length they brought up a large basket about ten feet in diameter containing two fine fish which the fisherman after returning the basket into the water immediately carried ashore and hid in the grass we then went a little farther down and took up another basket in which was one fish the fisherman now left us to carry his prizes to some neighboring market and the woman and boy proceeded with me in the canoe down the river about four o'clock we arrived at morzan a fishing town on the northern bank from whence i was conveyed across the river to Silla, a large town where i remained until it was quite dark under a tree surrounded by hundreds of people with a great deal of entreaty the duty allowed me to come into his balloon to avoid the rain but the place was very damp and i had a small paroxysm of fever during the night worn down by sickness exhausted with hunger and fatigue half naked and without any article of value by which i might procure provisions clothes or lodging i began to reflect seriously on my situation i was now convinced by painful experience that the obstacles to my farther progress were unsurmountable the tropical rains were already set in with all their violence the rice grounds and swamps were everywhere overflowed and in a few days more travelling of every kind unless by water would be completely obstructed the cowries which remained of the king of bambara's present were not sufficient to enable me to hire a canoe for any great distance and i had but little hopes of subsisting by charity in a country where the moors had such influence but above all i perceived that i was advancing more and more within the power of those merciless fanatics and from my reception both at sago and san sanding i was apprehensive that attempting to reach even jenny unless under the protection of some man of consequence amongst them which i had no means of obtaining i should sacrifice my life to no purpose for my discoveries would perish with me the prospect either way was gloomy in returning to the gambia a journey on foot of many hundred miles presented itself to my contemplation through regions and countries unknown nevertheless this seemed to be the only alternative for i saw inevitable destruction in attempting to proceed to the eastward with this conviction on my mind i hope my readers will acknowledge that i did right in going no farther having thus brought my mind after much doubt and perplexity to a determination to return westward i thought it incumbent on me before i left Silla, to collect from the moorish and negro traders all the information i could concerning the farther course of the niger eastward and the situation and extent of the kingdoms in its vicinity 
and the following few notices i receive from such various quarters as induce me to think they are authentic two short days journey to the eastward of scylla is the town of jenne which is situated on a small island in the river and is said to contain a great number of inhabitants than sago itself or any other town in bambara at the distance of two days more the river spreads into a considerable lake called dibi or the dark lake concerning the extent of which all the information i could obtain was that in crossing it from west to east the canoes lose sight of land one whole day from this lake the water issues in many different streams which terminate in two large branches one whereof flows towards the northeast and the other to the east but these branches join at cabra which is one day's journey to the southward of timbuktu and the port or shipping place of that city the tract of land which the two streams encircle is called jinbala and is inhabited by negroes and the whole distance by land from jenny to timbuktu is twelve days journey from cabra at the distance of eleven days journey down the stream the river passes to the southward of hosa which is two days journey distant from the river of the farther progress of this great river and its final exit all the natives with whom i conversed seem to be entirely ignorant their commercial pursuits seldom induce them to travel farther than the cities of timbuktu and hausa and as the sole object of these journeys is the acquirement of wealth they pay little attention to the course of rivers or the geography of countries it is however highly probable that the niger affords a safe and easy communication between very remote nations all my informants agreed that many of the negro merchants who arrive at timbuktu and hausa from eastward speak a different language from that of bambara or any other kingdom with which they are acquainted but even these merchants it would seem are ignorant of the termination of the river for such of them as can speak arabic describe the amazing length of its course in very general terms saying only that they believe it runs to the world's end the names of many kingdoms to the eastward of hosa are familiar to the inhabitants of bambara i was shown quivers and arrows of very curious workmanship which i was informed came from the kingdom of cassina on the north bank of the niger at short distance from scylla is the kingdom of massina which is inhabited by fulas they employ themselves there as in other places chiefly in pasturage and pay an annual tribute to the king of bambara for the lands which they occupy to the northeast of massina is situated the kingdom of timbuktu the great object of european research the capital of this kingdom being one of the principal marts for that extensive commerce which the moors carry on with the negroes the hopes of acquiring wealth in this pursuit and zeal for propagating their religion have filled this extensive city with moors and mohammedan converts the king himself and all the chief officers of state are moors and they are said to be more severe and intolerant in their principles than any other of the moorish tribes in this part of africa i was informed by a venerable old negro that when he first visited timbuktu he took up his lodgings at a sort of public inn the landlord of which when he conducted him into his hut spread a mat on the floor and laid a rope upon it saying if you are a muslim you are my friend sit down but if you are a kaffir you are my slave and with this rope i will lead you to market the present king of timbuktu is named abu abrahima 
he is reported to possess immense riches his wives and concubines are said to be clothed in silk and the chief officers of state live in considerable splendor the whole expense of his government is defrayed as i was told by a tax upon merchandise which is collected at the gates of the city the city of hausa the capital of a large kingdom of the same name situated to the eastward of timbuktu is another great mart for moorish commerce i conversed with many merchants who had visited that city and they all agreed that it is larger and more populous than timbuktu the trade police and government are nearly the same in both but in hosa the negroes are in greater proportion to the moors and have some share in the government concerning the small kingdom of jinbala i was not able to collect much information the soil is said to be more remarkably fertile and the whole country so full of creeks and swamps that the moors have hitherto been baffled in every attempt to subdue it the inhabitants are negroes and some of them are said to live in considerable affluence particularly those near the capital which is a resting place for such merchants as transport goods from timbuktu to the western parts of africa to the southward of jinbala is situated the negro kingdom of gato which is said to be of great extent it was formerly divided into a number of petty states which were governed by their own chiefs but their private quarrels invited invasion from the neighboring kingdoms at length a politic chief by the name of musi had address enough to make them unite in hostilities against bambara and on this occasion he was unanimously chosen general the different chiefs consenting for a time to act under his command musi immediately dispatched a fleet of canoes loaded with provisions from the banks of the lake dibi up the niger towards jenny and with the whole of his army pushed forwards into bambara he arrived on the bank of the niger opposite to jenny before the townspeople had the smallest intimation of his approach his fleet of canoes joined him the same day and having landed the provisions he embarked part of his army and in the night took jenny by storm this event so terrified the king of bambara that he sent messengers to sue for peace and in order to obtain it consented to deliver to mossi a certain number of slaves every year and return everything that had been taken from the inhabitants of gato mossi thus triumphant returned to gato where he was declared king and the capital of the country is called by his name on the west of gato is the kingdom of Beidou, which was conquered by the present king of bambara about seven years ago and has continued tributary to him ever since west of Beidou is manaea the inhabitants of which according to the best information i was able to collect are cruel and ferocious carrying their resentment towards their enemies so far as never to give quarter and even to indulge themselves with unnatural and disgusting banquets of human flesh end of volume two chapter sixteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c volume two chapter seventeen of the travels to the interior of africa by mungo park this librivox recording is in the public domain more zen to tafara having for the reasons assigned in the last chapter determined to proceed no farther eastward than scylla i acquainted the duty with my intention of returning to sego proposing to travel along the southern side of the river but he informed me that 
from the number of creeks and swamps on that side it was impossible to travel by any other route than along the northern bank and even that route he said would soon be impassable on account of the overflowing of the river however as he commended my determination to return westward he agreed to speak to some of the fishermen to carry me over to morzan i accordingly stepped into a canoe about eight o'clock in the morning of july thirtieth and in about an hour was landed at morzan at this place i hired a canoe for sixty cowries and in the afternoon arrived at key where for forty cowries more the duty permitted me to sleep in the same hut with one of his slaves this poor negro perceiving that i was sickly and that my clothes were very ragged humanely lent me a large cloth to cover me for the night july thirty first the duty's brother being going to modibu i embraced the opportunity of accompanying him thither there being no beaten road he promised to carry my saddle which i had left at key when my horse fell down in the woods as i now proposed to present it to the king of bambara we departed from key at eight o'clock and about a mile to the westward observed on the bank of the river a great number of earthen jars piled up together they were very neatly formed but not glazed and were evidently of that sort of pottery which is manufactured at downey a town to the west of timbuktu and sold to great advantage in different parts of bambara as we approached towards the jars my companion plucked up a large handful of herbage and threw it upon them making signs for me to do the same which i did he then with great seriousness told me that these jars belonged to some supernatural power that they were found in their present situation about two years ago and as no person had claimed them every traveller as he passed them from respect to the invisible proprietor threw some grass or the branch of a tree upon the heap to defend the jars from the rain thus conversing we travelled in the most friendly manner until unfortunately we perceived the footsteps of a lion quite fresh in the mud near the river side my companion now proceeded with great circumspection and at last coming to some thick underwood he insisted that i should walk before him i endeavoured to excuse myself by alleging that i did not know the road but he obstinately persisted and after a few high words and menacing looks threw down the saddle and went away this very much disconcerted me but as i had given up all hopes of attaining a horse i could not think of encumbering myself with the saddle and taking off the stirrups and girths i threw the saddle into the river the negro no sooner saw me throw the saddle into the water than he came running from the among the bushes where he had concealed himself jumped into the river and by help of his spear brought out the saddle and ran away with it i continued my course along the bank but as the wood was remarkably thick and i had reason to believe that a lion was at no great distance i became much alarmed and took a long circuit through the bushes to avoid him about four in the afternoon i reached modibu where i found my saddle the guide who had got there before me being afraid that i should inform the king of his conduct had brought the saddle with him in a canoe while i was conversing with the duty and remonstrating against the guide for having left me in such a situation i heard a horse neigh in one of the huts and the duty inquired with a smile if i knew who was speaking to me he explained himself by telling me that my horse was still alive and somewhat recovered from his fatigue but he insisted that i should take him along with me adding that he had once kept a moor's horse for four months 
and when the horse had recovered and got into good condition the moor returned and claimed it and refused to give him any reward for his trouble august first i departed from motobu driving my horse before me and in the afternoon reached niami where i remained three days during which time it rained without intermission and with such violence that no person could venture out of doors august fifth i departed from niami but the country was so deluged that i was frequently in danger of losing the road and had to wade across the savannas for miles together knee-deep in water even the corn ground which is the driest land in the country was so completely flooded that my horse twice stuck fast in the mud and was not got out without the greatest difficulty in the evening of the same day i arrived at niara where i was well received by the duty as the sixth was rainy i did not depart until the morning of the seventh but the water had swelled to such a height that in many places the road was scarcely passable and though i waded wet breast deep across the swamps i could only reach a small village called niambu where however for a hundred cowries i procured from some fulas plenty of corn for my horse and milk for myself august the eighth the difficulties i had experienced the day before made me anxious to engage a fellow traveller particularly as i was assured that in the course of a few days the country would be so completely overflowed as to render the road utterly impassable but though i offered two hundred cowries for a guide nobody would accompany me however on the morning following august ninth a moor and his wife riding upon two bullocks and bound for sago with salt passed the village and agreed to take me along with them but i found them of little service for they were wholly unacquainted with the road and being accustomed to a sandy soil were very bad travellers instead of waiting before the bullocks to feel if the ground was solid the woman boldly entered the first swamp riding upon the top of the load but when she had proceeded about two hundred yards the bullock sunk into a hole and threw both the load and herself among the reeds the frightened husband stood for some time seeming petrified with horror and suffered his wife to be almost drowned before he went to her assistance about sunset we reached sidby but the duty received me very coolly and when i solicited for a guide to san sanding he told me his people were otherwise employed i was shown into a damp old hut where i passed a very uncomfortable night for when the walls of the huts are softened by the rain they frequently become too weak to support the weight of a roof i heard three huts fall during the night and was apprehensive that the hut i lodged in would be the fourth in the morning as i went to pull some grass for my horse i counted fourteen huts which had fallen in this manner since the commencement of the rainy season it continued to rain with great violence all the tenth and the duty refused to give me any provisions i purchased some corn which i divided with my horse august eleventh the duty compelled me to depart from the town and i set out for san sanding without any great hopes of faring better than i had done at sibiti for i learned from people who came to visit me that a report prevailed and was universally believed that i had come to bambara as a spy and as masong had not admitted me into his presence the duties of the different towns were at liberty to treat me in what manner they pleased from repeatedly hearing the same story i had no doubt of the truth of it but as there was no alternative i determined to proceed and a little before sunset i arrived at san sanding my reception was what i expected count mamadi 
who had been so kind to me formerly, scarcely gave me welcome. Everyone wished to shun me, and my landlord sent a person to inform me that a very unfavorable report was received from Sago concerning me, and that he wished me to depart early in the morning. About ten o'clock at night, County Mamdi himself came privately to me and informed me that Masong had dispatched a canoe to Jenny to bring me back, and he was afraid I should find great difficulty in going to the west country. He advised me, therefore, to depart from San Sanding before daybreak, and cautioned me against stopping at Digani, or any town near Sago. August 12th. I departed from San Sanging and reached Kaba in the afternoon. As I approached the town, I was surprised to see several people assembled at the gate, one of whom, as I advanced, came running towards me, and taking my horse by the bridle, led me round the walls of the town, and then pointing to the west, told me to go along, or it would fare worse with me. It was in vain that I represented the danger of being benighted in the woods, exposed to the inclemency of the weather, and the fury of wild beasts. Go along, was all the answer, and a number of people coming up and urging me in the same manner, with great earnestness, I suspected that some of the king's messengers, who were sent in search of me, were in the town, and that these negroes, from mere kindness, conducted me past it with a view to facilitate my escape. I accordingly took the road for Sego, with the uncomfortable prospect of passing the night on the branches of a tree. After travelling about three miles, I came to a small village near the road. The duty was splitting sticks by the gate, but I found I could have no admittance. When I attempted to enter, he jumped up, and with the stick he held it in his hand, threatened to strike me off the horse if I presumed to advance another step. At a little distance from this village, and further from the road, is another small one. I conjured that, being rather out of the commune common route, the inhabitants might have fewer objections to give me house room for the night, and having crossed some cornfields, I sat down under a tree by the well. Two or three women came to draw water, and one of them, perceiving I was a stranger, inquired whither I was going. I told her I was going for Sego, but being benighted on the road, I wished to stay at the village until morning, and begged she would acquaint the duty with my situation. In a little time the duty sent for me, and permitted me to sleep in a large balloon. August 13th. About ten o'clock I reached a small village within half a mile of Sego, where I endeavored, but in vain, to procure some provisions. Every one seemed anxious to avoid me, and I can plainly perceive, by the looks and behavior of the inhabitants, that some very unfavorable accounts had been circulated concerning me. I was again informed that Masong had sent people to apprehend me, and the duty's son told me that I had no time to lose if I wished to get safe out of Bambara. I now fully saw the danger of my situation, and determined to avoid Sego altogether. I accordingly mounted my horse, and taking the road for Digali, travelled as fast as I could till I was out of sight of the villagers, when I struck to the westward, through high grass and swampy ground. About noon I stopped under a tree to consider what course to take, for I had now no doubt that the Moors and Slatees had misinformed the king respecting the object of my mission, and that people were absolutely in search of me to convey me prisoner to Sago. Sometimes I had thoughts of swimming my horse across the Niger, and going to the southward for Cape Coast, but reflecting that I had ten days to travel 
before i should reach kong and afterwards an extensive country to traverse inhabited by various nations whose language and manners i was totally unacquainted i relinquished this scheme and judged that i should better answer the purpose of my mission by proceeding to the westward along the niger endeavouring to ascertain how far the river was navigable in that direction having resolved upon this course i proceeded accordingly and a little before sunset arrived at a fula village called subu where for two hundred cowries i procured lodging for the night august fourteenth i continued my course along the bank of the river through a populous and well cultivated country i passed a walled town called camellia without stopping and at noon rode through a large town called sami where there happened to be a market and a number of people assembled in an open place in the middle of the town selling cattle cloth corn etc i rode through the midst of them without being much observed every one taking me for a moor in the afternoon i arrived at a small village called bini where i agreed with the duty son for one hundred cowries to allow me to stay for the night but when the duty returned he insisted that i should instantly leave the place and if his wife and son had not interceded for me i must have complied august fifteenth about nine o'clock i passed a large town called say which very much excited my curiosity it is completely surrounded by two very deep trenches at about two hundred yards distant from the walls on top of the trenches are a number of square towers and the whole has the appearance of a regular fortification about noon i came to the village of kamu situated upon the bank of the river and as the corn i had purchased at sibley was exhausted i endeavoured to purchase a fresh supply but was informed that corn was become very scarce all over the country and though i offered fifty cowries for a small quantity no person would sell me any as i was about to depart however one of the villagers who probably mistook me for some morris sherif brought me some as a present only desiring me to bestow my blessing upon him which i did in plain english and he received it with a thousand acknowledgments of this present i made my dinner and it was the third successive day that i had subsisted entirely upon raw corn in the evening i arrived at a small village called song the surely inhabitants of which would not receive me nor so much as permit me to enter the gate but as lions were very numerous in the neighbourhood and i had frequently in the course of the day observed the impression of their feet on the road i resolved to stay in the vicinity of the village having collected some grass for my horse i accordingly lay down under a tree by the gate about ten o'clock i heard the hollow roar of a lion at no great distance and attempted to open the gate but the people from within told me that no person must attempt to enter the gate without the duty's permission i begged them to inform the duty that a lion was approaching the village and i hoped he would allow me to come within the gate i waited for an answer to this message with great anxiety for the lion kept prowling round the village and once advanced so very near me that i heard him rustling among the grass and climbed the tree for safety about midnight the duty with some of his people opened the gate and desired me to come in they were convinced they said that i was not a moor for no moor ever waited any time at the gate of a village without cursing the inhabitants august sixteenth about ten o'clock i passed a considerable town with a mosque called jabi 
here the country begins to rise into hills and i could see the summits of high mountains to the westward about noon i stopped at a small village near yamina where i purchased some corn and dried my papers and clothes the town of yamina at a distance has a very fine appearance it covers nearly the same extent of ground as san sing but having been plundered by daisy king of carta about four years ago it has not yet resumed its former prosperity nearly one half of the town being nothing but a heap of ruins however it is still a considerable place and it is so much frequented by the moors that i did not think it safe to lodge in it but in order to satisfy myself respecting its population and extent i resolved to ride through it in doing which i observed a great many moors sitting upon the bentangs and other places of public resort everybody looked at me with astonishment but as i rode briskly along they had no time to ask questions i arrived in the evening at farah a walled village where without much difficulty i procured a lodging for the night august seventeenth early in the morning i pursued my journey and at eight o'clock passed a considerable town called bal abba after which the road quits the plain and stretches along the side of the hill i passed in the same course of this day the ruins of three towns the inhabitants of which were all carried away by daisy king of carta on the same day that he took and plundered yamina near one of these ruins i claimed a terramin tree but found the fruit quite green and sour and the prospect of the country was by no means inviting for the high grass and bushes seemed completely to obstruct the road and the lowlands were all so flooded by the river that the niger had the appearance of an extensive lake in the evening i arrived at kanika where the duty who was sitting upon an elephant's hide at the gate received me kindly and gave me for supper some milk and meal which i considered as to a person in my situation it really was a very great luxury august eighteenth by mistake i took the wrong road and did not discover my error until i had travelled nearly four miles when coming to an eminence i observed the niger considerably to the left directing my course towards it i travelled through long grass and bushes with great difficulty until two o'clock in the afternoon when i came to a comparatively small but very rapid river which i took at first for a creek or one of the streams of the niger however after i had examined it with more attention i was convinced that it was a distinct river and as the road evidently crossed it for i could see the pathway on the opposite side i sat down upon the bank in hopes that some traveller might arrive who would give me the necessary information concerning the fording place for the banks were so covered with reeds and bushes that it would have been almost impossible to land on the other side except at the pathway which on account of the rapidity of the stream it seemed very difficult to reach no traveller however arriving and there being a great appearance of rain i examined the grass and bushes for some way up the bank and determined upon entering the river considerably above the pathway in order to reach the other side before the stream had swept me too far down with this view i fastened my clothes upon the saddle and was standing up to the neck in water pulling my horse by the bridle to make him follow me when a man came accidentally to the place and seeing me in the water called to me with great vehemence to come out the alligators he said would devour both me and my horse if we attempted to swim over 
when i had got out the stranger who had never before seen a european seemed wonderfully surprised he twice put his hand to his mouth exclaiming in a low tone of voice god preserve me who is this but when he heard me speak the bambara tongue and found that i was going the same way as himself he promised to assist me in crossing the river the name of which he said was frina he then went a little way along the bank and called to some person who answered from the other side in a short time a canoe with two boys came paddling from among the reeds these boys agreed for fifty cowries to transport me and my horse over the river which was effected without much difficulty and i arrived in the evening at tafra a walled town and soon discovered that the language of the natives was improved from the corrupted dialect of bambara to the pure mandingo end of volume two chapter seventeen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c